Dear Jay, I'm a true crime reader and love the truth. I've read all of Anne Rule's books and like her daughter Leslie Rule as well. I'm very open, honest, open-minded, and outspoken. I have nothing to hide from you or the next. I've been locked up for over 21 years for a charge of murder for which I did not do. I've been fighting this since July 28, 1999. I was done so wrong too. My parents are deceased. My siblings turned their backs on me more so since this charge happened. I've been married and divorced twice. Once was for me in here. I'm not a punching bag anymore for anyone. I don't have children. I always wanted some, but the good Lord never gave me any. Just four miscarriages. I need attention to my case more than you know. That's what I've been trying to do, but it's hard to say and do things from in here. I've been molested several times in my life at the same age of seven and raped as well as beaten. I owned a two-story house and just had my second breast cancer surgery so I couldn't work. I sold my $3,000 stereo system and went into business selling weed while also smoking it. I smoked it for years to relax me and help me sleep because I have a problem sleeping on my own. My ex-dope dealer was always running out so I decided to get it from someone else. On my last day at his house he asked me if I wouldn't mind helping John Hines and his pregnant wife with a roof over their heads since I lived by myself at the time. I spoke to his wife Kimberly about moving in because he had them living in a tent in the woods on a lake called Platter Flats which was very unhealthy for the child. She was overjoyed. The guy I let live with me is one of the several guys who molested me. I spoke to him and told him I remember what you did to me when I was seven, but he started laughing at me. I told him I forgive you only because it's the right thing to do for the child. They moved in as well as a girl named Tessa Lynn Logan who was working at Sonic at the time. I told them all, $250 and all bills paid, but they need to help each other with food. I helped Kim get the health care she needed from the health department and food stamps. I also let Darrell H. and his best friend's ex, Elmo, or Daniel, live there. Elmo was here and there at my house. John Hines was doing meth. He started buying it from my ex-dealer and selling it. I started buying it from Brad all the time, so him and his friends was always coming to my house to party, get high, and have sex. He even had it out with John Hines, but I wasn't there when this took place because I was always on the go, selling from my house or other places. My friend... Katharina Lynn Anderson lived down the street from me with her boyfriend, so I would always go up there to have a few beers, talk, and do my washing because I didn't have electricity or water. Before John and his wife moved in, he asked me if I would drive the dope dealer's car back for him since he needed to get his truck from Platter Flats Lake. On the way over there, he asked if I remembered Susan. John said he was going to pry her away from her kids, get her in the car, kill her, and take her truck. I said, what? The heck you are. Take me home now. He said, I'm just joking. His wife turned around 
looked at me and said he's not joking. I yelled for them to take me home now. John said take it easy, I'm just pulling your leg. When he spoke to Susan, she was with a lot of people and couldn't leave. I was grateful for that. I told John straight up, no needles in my house, and that's what I meant, but he didn't listen. He started being controlling, and I saw him push his wife Kim into the wall. He was always on meth, and was bringing in stolen guns from a robbery he pulled off. John was even moving people into my house without me knowing it. I ran into Melinda Robin one day, and she wanted to party and buy some weed. She always had issues with bringing people into my house that I didn't know, even if I asked her not to. One day, she brought Brooke, Alice, and Blattner into my house to purchase a bag of weed. I was so upset. I took her to the side and told her not to do it again. She said she wouldn't. The girl bought a bag for me, smoked one with me and the others that were there, and left. Later that night, she came back to my house with her girlfriend, Rhonda, and wanted more, and also asked if I knew where to get some meth. John was selling, so I called him into the living room to meet Brooke and his girlfriend. Although he didn't know her, she claimed she knew him. She made a habit of coming over and saying she knew John very well until he started believing it and going along with it. My friend, Katarina Lynn Anderson, or Kat, was having problems with her boyfriend who she lived down the street with. When he told her it was over and to get out of his house, she talked to me about staying and I told her she was always welcome in my home. One day, she was talking in front of me, John, Tessa, Kim, Brooke, Rhonda, and Elmo about some settlement checks coming from her dad's trailer or something like that and that she could help with any bills that needed to be taken care of. I told her that that was up to her, but she was like me and would give you the shirt off her back. John was a bad, evil man who started plotting on her from what was told to me. He was a serious druggie and wanted her money badly. I was a drug dealer and user just as he was, but he was really bad. When Kat came to tell me that her stuff was out in her boyfriend's yard, we got it loaded up and she moved in. We had fun times. I've known Kat for years, and we kind of grew up together. We always had fun at keg parties, cruising the main street, chilling with our friends, or going to bars, like the biker bar Ed Stone owned on Breezy Hill. I even worked there at one point. She had a very giving heart. I believe she moved into my house two weeks prior to John and everyone starting to plan her murder. She had already cashed two of her checks that I didn't know of until Kim told me that Kat took her baby shopping. She bought a stereo with a CD player, a LeBaron car, and some kind of Jeep that needed a part that she had ordered. Kat asked in front of John if I would show her how to drive it, since it was a five-speed. I said, sure. John got mad. He said, if I'm the one putting the part on, I should be the one showing you how to drive the dang thing. Cat says she wanted me to teach her. This made John really mad. He left the house, slamming the door on his way out. A few days later, Brooke came back to my house 
asking me if I wanted to buy some stuff from Burger King. I said yes. On the night before the murder, John asked me to ask Brooke Blattner what color her eyes were and if she wanted to make a thousand dollars. I asked her. She eventually said yes. When I asked John what he had in mind about making that kind of money, he said you'll see so evil like. On July the 20th, when I was in the living room, Brooke asked me if my dope dealer would buy some stuff she had gotten from Burger King the night before where she was the night manager. I said I don't see why not. We went to her house to load up the food and I saw her grab a needle so I asked her what it was for. Brooke said John wanted it. I reminded her that there would be no needles in my house and John knows that. She told me that John had been shooting up and asked if I knew. Although I said no, something told me he was. Brooke put the needle in the glove box. The food was in the back seat or trunk. We went to my old dope dealer's house and he agreed to buy the food. We left and went back to my house where Cat was sitting on my porch drinking a beer. Cat says she just got out of the shower from William's house next door. She was waiting for me to get back to play some pool, so I said sure. She said John, Kim, and Tessa were in the house, but they didn't want to play with her. Cat said she was going to put on some makeup first. Brooke said come and I'll play you, so we went inside to play. When we entered the house, Kim was cooking and Tessa was washing dishes. I was already high on meth, so it didn't matter how much weed I smoked. I was just wasting it. While I was playing pool with Brooke, we had three air conditioners going and the music was blurring. I kept leaving the pool room to go to the kitchen to be nosy. John was standing on the outside of the bathroom like he was waiting for Cat to get through, but I didn't know what he was really up to. I asked him why the front door was shut, because I never shut it. He claimed Elmo was being a pest. He asked me to tell Elmo to go to the store to get some rolling papers when he shows up. I told Brooke to rack the balls so we can play again before going to grab another beer. John wasn't out there this time, so I thought he went to his room. I saw Kat's purse on the kitchen counter and knew she hadn't left yet. When I came back to the pool room, Brooke wasn't there. I said, Brooke, where are you? Then she came flying out of John's room, saying John wants you to bring him that needle by the stereo. I told her that I saw her and John filling that needle with degreaser before asking what they were going to do with it. I went to the table, picked it up, and was mad about it being in my house. When I opened the door, John grabbed my wrist and tried to make me stab Cat in the arm with it. I jerked back and it went into the wall and floor. Nothing touched her. I screamed to get off my friend and what are you doing to her? He shoved me into the corner of the door frame where a gas line was, cutting my ankle. I didn't know Brooke had been in John's room helping him kill my friend by choking her to death. John had his way with her because her shorts were on top of her and he was on top of her back. She was face down. My friend was already dead when I opened the door. I tried to run to the front door, but noticed that I couldn't get out of it. 
My back door was padlocked from the outside, and all windows were nailed down because people had been breaking into my house when I wasn't there. I started throwing up. There was no getting out of the house because John wouldn't let me. Although I knew nothing about it, John let Brooke leave to get gasoline and pick up Rhonda from her mom's house. When she returned, she sent Rhonda in the house to grab the keys to the back door. Kat's body had already been moved to the back of my house. Tessa got rid of the needle like John had told her and kept everyone else in the pool room. John was going to take me, Kim, Brooke, and Rhonda with him. They loaded Cat in the trunk of the car. I had no idea where we were going. John told me not to try anything funny or I could end up the same way. He stopped at the Easy Mart on Highway 75 to get some gas for the car and sent me inside to pay for it. When I got in there, the man asked me if I was okay. I said, no, I'm not. He asked me if I was hurt. I said, not really me, just my ankle, but someone else is. John started walking towards the store. I said, I got to go, as John grabbed my arm. John asked what I told him. I said, nothing, John, nothing. He shoved me in the car while they laughed at me. I started crying before John told me to shut up. When I looked out the window, I saw that we were going across the Denison Dam Bridge. We went down a dirt road before John stopped the car. Brooke, Rhonda, and John got out while he told me and Kim not to move. He let me out to use the bathroom if I made it fast. I saw the moon shining on the water. I knew we were at some part of the lake. I saw them get Cat out of the trunk and take her somewhere not too far from the car, but not close either. Rhonda came running back to the car first and said John wanted me to turn the car around. When I said no, Rhonda did it. Brooke ran back to the car, jumped in, and said John had just set her on fire. I said, oh my God. We all saw John run to the car and try to slide across the hood, but he fell to the ground. He jumped up and got in the car before trying to speed off. I saw a big explosion from the fire, but didn't say anything. They were all scared of John. They all make it look like I did this, or said this, or that, and I didn't. When the cops showed up seven days later, I was glad to see them. John drove to a bank where Cat's last check was to be cashed. He made me go in with Brooke while he stood on the outside waiting to see if I tried to run. When Brooke got the $5,000, John snatched the money from her hands. He gave her a thousand of it, gave Kim 500, kept 1500 for himself, and gave me 2000 to split with Tessa. I did spend some of the money. I was a dope dealer. I was about money and dope. I bought things, no lie, so did they. I missed my friend, even though I couldn't have saved her. I didn't know she was dead. I have asked God to forgive me for spending some of the money and letting them in my house. I will never let anyone live with me again. At the time, I was 83 pounds, and John beat the heck out of me, chasing me around my pool table, threatening me if I told He'd kill me. Grayson County played good cop, bad cop with me 
and tried to make me look bad. Even when they took me back to my house to try to record what happened, I didn't know because I was not in the room. I told them I went to open the door and John grabbed my arm. They kept saying not to say that. They told me to say that I opened the door to stab her, even though that wasn't true and I would never do that to someone. A lawyer in Austin, Texas wants to help me by taking my case and hiring some investigators, but I don't have the money. I do want to open a restaurant one day, but I don't think it will happen. I just want to relocate and live my life better than better. Well, it's late, so I have to close tonight till I hear from you again. Sleep with the angels. Sincerely, a new found friend, Becky McConnell.